long-term member of the yoga community. He's been part of the community for more than 30 years. Um, in his time, he studied Iyengar yoga for about 15 years and then moved on to shadow yoga, all with his primary teacher. Uh, now, is it Zandor or Jandor? How do you pronounce well, I, I knew Shandor before he changed his name back to Xander, which yeah. is kind of the Hungarian pronunciation that's correct. I, because I've known him for so long, I still call him Shandor. I probably am naughty, yeah. but um, I, so, I, if I say Shandor, I mean Xander. Okay, so we'll say Xander. So you studied with Xander for about 20 years until he basically told you, you know, it was time to, you, time to leave. Um, and you also founded Manduka, founded Manduka, and you're an architect. Um, yes. And in 2007, you released a DVD called Gravity and Grace, Yoga for Finding Your Inner Teacher, which has gone on to have huge success as far as the yoga DVD is concerned. So you've done a lot of things in your time, not just in yoga, but um, you know, in other things as well. So welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you for the call. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on here. Now, you are coming to New Zealand, and we'll get to that shortly. But first, let's talk a little bit about um, your teacher, Xander, as I call him, <laughs> as he's called now. How did you How did you discover him? How, and you worked with him, did you say, for 20 years? Yeah. I. Uh, what a lot of people, especially in the States, don't know is I'm actually a New Zealand citizen. Um, yeah. I, I went to, uh, um, after university, I, I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico, played on, a, of all things, a rugby team. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the rugby players on our team was from... Uh, Palmerston North, and uh, and so I was just curious about New Zealand at that time, and our team actually was really good by American standards, terrible by New Zealand standards, <laughs> but we, we organized a tour to New Zealand because he had contacts, and I, I tell you, I got off the plane in, in Auckland, and I, just walking down uh, the, you know, through the airport and seeing Auckland from the air, I knew I, I wanted to stay, and then it was just trying to figure out a way to stay. And so many coincidental things happened uh, that allowed me to stay. And I, I ended up living uh, with Auckland for a few years, and then six years in Wellington. Stopped playing rugby literally after I met Xander for the first time in Wellington. And mm. although I'd been doing yoga up to that point, it was pretty what I call pedestrian yoga. And, and Xander kind of. Uh, taught me a different yoga that I was practicing and it just stuck and after eight years in New Zealand I, I Xander uh, asked me to like study with his teacher he said you know you really should go to India and study with Iyengar and and so he helped me you know set set myself up in India for a year and I studied there for a year and and then when I got back to the States, I, I decided when I left New, New Zealand that I was going to give the United States another try. Uh, and, you know, Xander had not yet traveled to the States in those days. And when I got back after being in India, I noticed he was coming to the States for the first time down in L.A. at Yoga Works. So I, I went down there and met him. And... He had remembered me, even though we weren't really close uh, in the early days, he remembered me and he said, uh, you know, I, I'd like to come to the States more. Could you help organize my tours? Which I did for, oh, we had, Ten you know, a very event. close relationship. I mean, we traveled together. I organized tours around the Western U.S., Canada and Mexico. And we, he wanted me to like manage the travel details be his assistant during class, and I I really learned a lot just in that role of being, I don't know, like a personal assistant slash apprentice, (laughs) and and so that was was a beautiful thing, and and then the day came when... uh, when it was time to say goodbye, you know, he, he had seen in me something that he felt I was uh, getting maybe too dependent on the teacher, and... uh, you know, I was really good at being like a like a mini me. You know, like a a, a Shandor uh, light. I call it Shandor Xander light back in those days. You know, like I was a little bit more approachable, a little bit more personal, and uh, and I, I just found that that was a great way to move into places where he had been and taught and people connected. But at that point, I think he realized that it would not serve me. Uh, long term to be an apprentice and mm. 
you know, I, I joke about this. That on the day that he talked to me about that, I, I was expecting something else. I was expecting him to say, you're a good student. Now I'm going to teach you some of this esoteric stuff that I've only ever talked about with you. <laughs> and what he, what he said was, frankly, it's time to get off the tit. And uh, <laughs> that, that was not exactly what I was hoping to hear in that moment. And, uh, and the thing that was then, you know, he, was, he saw that I was struggling with that. And he, he mm. said, you know, uh, it's not like I'm kicking you out. It's for your going good, and uh, and the other thing that I'm going to tell you now, which may be difficult to hear, is I don't want you to teach anything I ever taught you. Mm. And I know. So how do you integrate yeah. that in the moment? You know. Yeah. So so it took me a few years to like what just happened. You know, literally, it took me two years to yeah. figure out what is happening. How is that dissolving? just like that and literally it was like just turning like the light switch uh, off. There was and then no you know I, I went through some personal things uh, that were very difficult and I actually stopped teaching and I practiced a little but it was more out of necessity because my body started to hurt all my rugby injuries started coming back but then when I started to understand what was happening why he did that and I, and I to this day I still think that he had love in his heart when he did that. He, he, mm -hmm. he was thinking about me. It wasn't something personal uh, in terms of I did something wrong or he didn't like me anymore. And, uh, and then I started to understand how at some point the discipline has to come from an intuitive place, not uh, like a recipe place, like mm -hmm. to just repeat what he taught me and to do as best a job as I could at, you know, doing the way he does it, it can only take you so far. And in the journey of yoga, if you're, if you think about it, you know, if you're trying to follow a recipe, you're using a part of the brain that's like linear. Mm -hmm. And what he was trying to get me to do is switch out of that part of the brain into the more intuitive part of the brain, which is where yoga happens, frankly. It's, mm -hmm. it's where that present moment experience uh, allows you insight that's really hard to find in my experience from just following a set routine every day or hearing your instructors, uh, you know, cues in, in your head. It, it just, it's, it's not as complete as this more intuitive aspect of yoga. And so literally after, you know, five years of you know, shadow yoga with him, because uh, he was teaching Iyengar yoga in the earlier days. Mm. He was developing shadow yoga, I was learning shadow yoga, and then he kind of cuts me loose, and it's like, okay, what, what, now what? And what, how do I set this up? So I, I look back at my life as a yogi, and it was injuries, and it was difficulties, uh, physical and emotional difficulties that really motivated me uh, to pursue yoga. And so then that's where the, the light bulb moment went off when I realized that all those challenges, physical and, and psychological, were gifts, you know, and that's a huge step to take. And it's, mm -hmm. it, I, I speak about it casually now, but back in the day, it wasn't so easy as just, oh, a light bulb goes off, make mm -hmm. the change. Light bulb went that off. I saw the uh, range, and let's say, long into the end of our lives. And mm -hmm. that's what this second DVD is more about. Mm -hmm. So do you find that when you're teaching then you've got this methodology of working with gravity and grace, yet is that just a, almost a technique in and of itself to teach people the process of yoga, of tuning into their own intuitive voice, their own inner teacher? Yeah. You know, I joke uh, in class a lot, and you're probably noticing this from this interview, but uh, I tell my students that my voice in a class is like Muzak in an elevator, that, <laughs> that you kind of you hear it, but you're not really conscious of it. You know, you're conscious of this inner space that you're occupying inside an elevator and that background noise is just reminding you that you're in an elevator. Mm -hmm. um, so my voice, in a way, is trying to get out of the way of the student's intuitive experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's used as a guide of where to uh, observe in your body where you're holding subconscious or unconscious tension. Mm -hmm. And through that release of 
unconscious or subconscious tension, space opens. Mm -hmm. And in that moment that space opens is what I call grace. And in that grace moment of yoga asana, the intuition lets you know how to move. And it's like when you think about a balance pose. If, if I were to ask you to stand on one leg right now, if you were trying to think of the recipe of how to stand on one leg, like mm -hmm. spread your toes, lift your kneecap, tuck, you know, internally rotate the thigh, all these common yoga instruction for standing poses, you're going to fall on one leg. It's because balance operates in the moment, in the present moment. So what, what I'm trying to do in class is turn every pose literally into a balance pose. Even Tadasana is a balance pose, if you think about it, mm. the standing mountain pose. So how do I r remove that mental chatter of pull the kneecaps up, you know, whatever the instruction is, whatever style of yoga you're doing, how do I uh, kind of put that aside and just get into the direct experience of standing? Mm -hmm. what, what do I need to do to stand and stay from falling? And the way I challenge people is I say, place one foot in front of the other like you're walking a tightrope. So that changes Tadasana a lot. Mm -hmm. And then when you're standing with your feet lined up like that, close one eye and now if you're going through that recipe of lifting the kneecaps and internally rotating the thighs you you're gonna come down with one eye closed i guarantee it and and then for the people that follow the instruction and start to drop into their intuition and releasing of tension then i say close both eyes mm -hmm. and uh if you come to the workshop I'll tell you what comes next. Yeah, I'm so curious. Okay, so cause <laughs> that takes a certain level of skill. And I mean, I there's not that many teachers out there who, who it's beyond technique, right? It's teaching people how to be a te like how to be their own internal teacher. So yeah, That's let's right. talk about you coming to New Zealand. So you're coming to New Zealand. I'm guessing because you're fond of the country would be one reason, right? <laughs> of course. No, I living there eight years. I have some. I mean, I have a second family there. People that you know, saw this poor American with this terrible accent mm -hmm. coming to New Zealand because he loved the country, and they just kind of took me in, and I I worked for the sweetest guy in Wellington, Ian Athfield, who's a pretty well-known architect in, in New Zealand, and it, he just kind of adopted me into his family in a way, uh, in a similar way that Shandor, uh, Xander sorry, uh, took me in and kind of took me under his wing, and, and then just the people that you know, people that I lived with there are still there, Kiwis mm -hmm. that I just have a fondness for. I haven't seen in, you know, 10, 15 years uh, since the last time I was back. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like a homecoming for me, um, really. Now, you're going to be down in the South Island, right, at Aroha, and just outside of Queenstown. So, Aroha is this um, amazing eco wellness retreat. Apply myself. Do you want to tell us and a little bit about the retreat? Mostly through trial and error, come up with this system of yoga that I'm teaching now, which I refer to as gravity and grace, uh, mm -hmm. using these two subtle forces, one is a physical force and one is a non-physical force, mm -hmm. to, um, to educate where imbalance exists in my body and in my mind, and through that process of identifying where uh, imbalance exists, to then intuitively cultivate a practice. and. The practice evolved into this three-part practice. Some of these things are ideas that he gave me, but the way I'm putting it together is so different than what he's currently teaching now or has ever taught. Mm -hmm. But there's an opening sequence, which is basically a warm-up. Uh, there's a dynamic sequence, which is kind of the cardio heat-producing aspect of the practice. And then there's a closing sequence, which is this calming meditative kind of practice, mostly restorative type poses, inversions, forward bends, etc. And through that process and, and then some other things that, that I'll be teaching when I come to New Zealand, um, you develop this intimacy with gravity in a way that's non-muscular. And, and really, you know, when I think about power yoga, and it, this is kind of a, a funny story, if I don't mind, if we've got the time here, but when I my first DVD, uh, Yoga for Finding Your Inner Teacher, the producer of the DVD was this Hollywood guy, you know, and in one of these meetings that you can just picture, you know, in a boardroom in a Hollywood high rise building, um, he's saying, you know, we need a name, and and I said, well, what do you mean? He says, we need a name for the DVD, and 
and uh, what's your style of yoga? And I say, well, it's Hatha yoga. And he says, no, we need we need something sexy, you know. And he said, like power <laughs> yoga or yeah. hot yoga. Or, and it was just like, well, let me give it some thought, you know. So I went back, gave it some thought. And what I actually came up with, he didn't like very much, was uh, deep power yoga. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, <laughs> if you understand the subtlety of that, it's it's like removing excessive muscular force to open these subtle channels inside the body that, mm. you know, when you use excessive muscular force, those channels get squeezed and, and the flow of sensation and the flow of fluid, frankly, blood, and gets slightly restricted. So yeah. through this process, they didn't like deep power yoga either. So I, I had to like dig a little deeper and that's where the gravity and grace came in uh, because I've been using these two elements through the teaching and through my practice, and it, it just had a nice poetic ring to it, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so that's how it ended up. My my second DVD has the same kind of main title, Gravity and Grace, but it's more yoga for longevity, which has to do with me getting older. I think a little bit like how do we find these practices that are going to sustain us until we're eighty. Mm-hmm. And, you know, doing power yoga till you're 80, I mean, some people probably can do it, but there's a rare minority. Most of us are starting to accept some of the limitations with aging. And how do we do that gracefully? How do, how do we work with, you know, a body that's losing some of its flexibility? Out of it, out of oh, my God. This vitality. is such a great story, too, okay. because... When I got back to the States, you know, uh, even in California, I'm still dreaming about living in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And and so here I was in my perfect world manifesting, thinking, okay, what in my perfect world would I want is I'd say, oh, I'd like to live in New Zealand half the year and live in California half the year. That would be my perfect world. Uh, The reality of that is impossible just because of the travel involved and blah, blah, blah. However, in through that that dream of how can I make a, a, a connection back with New Zealand? And I thought, well, what would it look like? You know, it's got to be, you know, a special place. And what special place for me? South Island. And what's my favorite place in the South Island? Well, it's tough. It's either, you know, Nelson, uh, Abel Tasman area, or it's Queenstown and the sounds, you know? And, and so, uh, and then just miracles started to happen. This uh, connection that I had with uh, Damien, uh, he was a student of mine when he was working at Essel in Big Sur mm-hmm. in California. And I, I didn't really know him that well. Uh, he, I think he would, went to one of my retreats there. Uh, he was on staff at Essel. And, and, uh, and so Ingrid, who's the Manduka rep in, in uh, New Zealand, uh, made the connection. And, Damien goes, oh, of course I know Peter. He's he's my favorite American yoga teacher. We got to get him here. And it's like, just sign me up, you know. And then I saw the website yeah. of this place, and the architect in me is like looking at this place. It's mm-hmm. a spectacular design, you know, in the mountains overlooking the lake and the Alps, and you couldn't ask for a more beautiful place to do mm-hmm. yoga. And the program that he set up there with, you know, he – he sets the diet. He sets the schedules. It's really much more than yoga. It's it's like a whole fitness, mental and psychological fitness retreat. And uh, you know, on the personal level, I'm excited to take myself through that. You know, it's not just about yoga. It's about diet. It's about sleep. It's about you know hiking through the mountains as a physical, you know, stamina exercise and. You know, my 60-year-old body is like going, let's do it. Let's, let's try and make this happen. So so you're teaching, how long's the retreat that you're teaching down there? It's, it's five days. Five day and, retreat. Uh, you know, what we're also doing through Manduka is teaching these free events around New Zealand. Uh, mm. when, when we land in Auckland, I'm going to be giving a class. Um, Ingrid set the details up, and I'm sure it'll be on someone's website in New Zealand at some point. Uh, somewhere down near the water in uh, off Queen Street, in, in and Auckland. basically just a class, a free kind of a introduction to the company Manduka because it's not that well known in New Zealand, mm-hmm. and, and then also my teaching, and and then hopefully uh, we 
get some people interested in the retreat. And then we're going to teach another one of those classes in Wellington and another mm-hmm. class in Queenstown. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so there's three free classes that people can do. So if this trip goes well and these classes go well and there's lots of interest, does that mean that potentially you might come back and do more retreats in New Zealand? <laughs> Uh, you know, I only go to places where there's an invitation, and uh-huh. what the invitation requires is a, a relationship, you mm-hmm. know. Um, uh, I don't really, I mean, I get this happening a lot lately uh, since the second DVD is out, is just cold calls from people saying, will you come to Mar Center in, like, Nebraska? And, <laughs> and I have to say, well, I can't, only because my time is uh, kind of limited in a way. But if you have a relationship with me where you understand what I'm teaching, uh, like come to another program somewhere, and then if we connect, if you like who I am and it's vice versa, of course I'll come to Nebraska. I mean, I'm I'm about to leave to go to Cleveland and Columbus, Ohio, you know, and that's not exactly New Zealand, but the strength of the relationship is what's drawing me there. And mm-hmm. the, there's students that... Uh, really appreciate what I'm teaching, uh, especially the students, you know, if, if there was a student, if I could classify a student, it would be someone who has worked with injuries, you know, no matter what the age, we, we all accumulate these injuries, and they haven't, they've gotten some improvement from yoga, but they, they haven't healed themselves, and what I'm finding is through this gravity and grace approach, the body's natural healing forces are supported and real healings takes place. And mm. I, I've, I've seen things that I've got some great stories, which I could share with you maybe when we meet in New Zealand, but, but things that people have overcome that are really, uh, I, I don't want to say miracles because that's a bit strong, but mm. amazing, you know? Mm. So then one final question, um, what has yoga, what's been the most amazing thing yoga's done for you in your life? You know, the truth of the matter is, it's made me a kinder human being. Um, mm. Z- Xander taught me this. Uh, he said, if if uh, if you want to know the quality of your relation or uh, your, the quality of your practice, look at your personal relationships. Mm. No matter how intimate a yoga practice you have, if that's not reflected in the quality of your personal relationships then I would question the practice. And, you know, when I was younger, I I had, you know, I I was writing for Yoga Journal and teaching at all their conferences. And and to be honest, looking back on that, I wasn't a very nice person. I was a very difficult person. And and to be honest, I I had a lot of problem students, you know, like needy, kind of just difficult students. And... And then, you know, through this transition with Xander and this kind of wake-up call that I got in my own life, uh, Gravity and Grace, that influence of this practice started to soften this so many the quality of my relationships. relationships. I, I didn't have as many friends, but the quality of the friends and the quality of student that I had was night and day different. And to be honest now, you know, like I said about relationship and going, Part of me when I go to a place is because I have friends there now and I want to spend time with them and share on a personal level. Mm-hmm. And my hope is, is that's going to happen in New Zealand. You know, like I have friends there, none of them do yoga, but you know, maybe some, <laughs> they're all rug players and architects who need yoga bad. <laughs> I'm hoping that I'll get some friends in the yoga community in New Zealand and, and yeah, of course. Uh, to be honest, I'd love to come back to Aroha every year. It's such a magnificent place. Awesome. Well, Peter, thank you so much for sharing yourself with us on the Yoga Lunchbox. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Same. Um, yeah, and we will be seeing you in New Zealand shortly. I look forward to it.